people. I can see that there's a few of you. Um, so unfortunately, my abstract got a little bit cut off, but I put it at the top here. This image, building rocky, plant, building rocky worlds, this image that hopefully you can see, it's a little bit um, washed out. This is where I was to the day last year. This is the La Palma 2021 eruption. Oh and um, I just wanted to show you this because I study um, the earth as well. So many of you may have been to the observatory on top of La Palma. It's an absolutely stunning location. I had the great privilege to be uh, at the volcano for the eruption last year. And here are just some of this one got cut off a little bit, but this, it was pretty phenomenal. So uh, this was exactly a year ago. I'm not going to talk about La Palma. I'm going to talk about how our isolated calibration point, which is the solar system, fits into this amazing field of exoplanetary science. This, I just took this off the, the internet. Um, I think this was on Sunday. So far, there's five, over 5,000 confirmed exoplanets. There's 9,000 candidate planets, and there's nearly 4,000 planetary systems. So I, I don't know about you, but I certainly can't keep up with this. This is uh, the Halloween background for the NASA exoplanetary exploration. And this is a uh, YZ SETI D, which apparently is, is red. So they decided to make it a Dracula theme. It's about 12 light years from us. So all of you probably know this. This is a, a frequency diagram, total number actually of exoplanets discovered versus time. And obviously 1995 was a very big year for exoplanetary science. Um, and since then, there's been an explosion in the number of uh, exoplanets that have been discovered, especially with missions like Kepler. And obviously the methods by which they're discovered, uh, you understand them better than I do, but of course they range from um, transit photometry, which makes up about 75% of all discoveries, um, radial velocity, which makes up around 20%. And then of course, this very important one of direct imaging. I think there are 61 directly imaged exoplanets and that accounts for about 1% of the population. Now, the discoveries of course are happening mainly for large mass bodies that are close to their star for various reasons, mainly because they're much easier to detect through these different methods. But of course, with the, the new Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope, we might be getting down to planetary bodies that match our own solar system. And so this, this is a very exciting time for bringing together, emerging our understanding of our own solar system with these exoplanetary bodies. And I'm not the first to say this, I'm certainly not going to be the last, um, and unfortunately it did get cut off here, but it says along with discoveries, attempts to understand them and Earth's place within it. And there's been a very significant um, attempt to sort of look at how geoscience and exoplanetary science could merge itself. This is a, a recent article or a recent actual um, uh, edition of Elements, which is normally a geochemistry magazine, where they had a series of papers on uh, for example, polluted white dwarfs, which are in the corner there, um, and how exoplanetary science and geochemistry might fit in. This is not new. There's been some really important papers on how we could constrain the interior structure of rocky exoplanets from their mass and radius measurements. This is well known. And there's, of course, this important paper by Fisher and Valentini, the planetary metallicity correlation, showing a very strong correlation with the metallicity of the star, the more iron over hydrogen it has, the more likely you, you are to have exoplanetary systems. And it will be very interesting with these new, the Nancy Roman Space Telescope and others to see how well these correlations match to lower mass planets. This growing call for interdisciplinary um, collaboration can be sort of summed up from this, from one of the papers, which was the composition of XC of rocky exoplanets by Patirka, Dawn, Hinkle, and Unterborn, where they said the disciplines of geology and astronomy 
have existed at a considerable remove for greater than 300 years. The discovery of rocky exoplanets during the last two decades, however, requires the closing of that distance. Knowledge and methods in one discipline can affect hypotheses in the other. The limitations of each field drive innovation in the other. No better example is the interpretation of rocky exoplanet compositions. So we can see that there's an explosion, not just in the this, this study of exoplanets and, and their discovery, but also in thinking about how they might vary compositionally. And when it comes down to it, we're a very curious species in many ways, but one of the most important things that we all seek is, is there life beyond our own solar system? Frankly, is there life within our solar system beyond Earth? And so much of the thinking about exoplanets is, has focused on either the age of the star, the distance of the, the exoplanet from the star, and the star type. So this is just showing you sort of the Goldilocks zones where you might find um, habitable zones around hot stars, of course, further out, makes sense, sun-like stars and cooler stars. Or over on those diagrams to the left, uh, one is from Arecibo, just showing you where the, the uh, habitable zone might be for these hot and cooler stars, and based on their age. Unfortunately, that's cut off as well, but it shows that as you get older, the habitable zone theoretically will change with time. The, the metallicity issue is, and it's been cut off as well, I'm sorry about this. The, the metallicity um, of stars does correlate very well, it would seem, with the abundance of planets and exoplanets around those stars. This is a, a diagram from um, Fisher and Valentini, that paper that I mentioned. And if you were to look out here, you'd see that there's virtually nothing in this side of the plot. But as you go to high iron over hydrogen ratios, which is a good measure of metallicity of, of these particular stars, you see that there's more exoplanets. This was taken in 2005. I haven't seen an update. There probably is an update. But there's a very good correlation with how the metallicity of those stars and the, the exoplanets surrounding them. And what's really interesting, this one I took from um, a group in Uppsala, where they're plotting X over H. So this is basically any element you can think of, more or less, but over the hydrogen ratio. So the sun would be about here. And you can see that stars with planets, shown in yellow here, tend to have higher metallicity than even our own sun. Now, there could be a, an inherent bias here because we're looking mainly at large exoplanets at the moment, but it will be very interesting to see how this relationship turns out. But I'm not gonna talk about all those things. I'm just bringing, hopefully, to you. Yes, no, I mean, George. It, you know, it, it, it's weird that it's, it's actually heavier things. It's strontium and yttrium, for example. Um, so I'm just wondering, there are weird systems that have enrichments in those heavy things and depletions relative to solar in, in lighter things that would you know, cause a loss of fire. Yeah, it depends on your source, doesn't it? It depends on, presumably, for these stars. I mean, I'm, I don't know which stars these exactly are. First, I, I want to know how large the error bars here are. But <clears throat> assuming that those are true, these could be coming from you know, multiple supernova type events that are bringing in these, these heavier nuclei. But the reality is we simply, you know, we need to get more data on smaller mass planets and, and probably better data on, on these things. I think the iron hydrogen ratio is probably a better proxy than, than say yttrium, where it's gonna be very difficult to, to measure. Yeah, right. Yeah. Unfortunately, it's cut off again, but this is a very interesting paper. The, the title of the paper is A Water Budget Dichotomy of Rocky Protoplanets from Aluminium 26 Heating. It's, um, it's been a very popular paper, and I'm going to focus particularly on aluminium 26. And I'm English, so if I say alumina or aluminium, please forgive me. I, I try to, to say it so it doesn't, my students all laugh at me, but 
<laughs> you might hear me say aluminium a few times. So aluminium 26 is a really important early synthesized uh, nuclide. And the reason for that is it has a half-life of about 700,000 years. And alumina, aluminium is a major element in our own solar system. It makes up about 0.84% of the bulk solar system for refractory elements. So other than hydrogen and helium. So it's a major player in early processes. And that's because as it decays with this very short half-life, it produces an enormous amount of heat. So the idea of this paper, and I've taken their summary diagram here, is that if you come from a, an exoplanetary system or a, a planetary system that has a very high ratio of aluminum 26 from its production in supernovae, then the likelihood is it's going to heat all of your little objects that are forming around the star and it's going to produce excessive melting. And that excessive melting is going to lead to planets that are either completely dry or planets that are water worlds. Conversely, if you don't have a lot of that aluminum 26, you're going to end up with more like icy bodies and ocean worlds. That's the, the basic premise of this paper. And they go through a, a series of, of models to show you know, how this could theoretically take place. I mean, aluminum 26 comes from one type of supernovae. And so your separation there is just which kind of supernovae went off nearby? They didn't say that specifically in the paper. They do discuss it. But they, they're essentially saying, look, you either have it or you don't. OK? It's a, it's a binary question. Yes, yeah, Actually, everything makes a little bit of sense. It turns out novi or a major source of aluminum 26. So they have it. it's, it's not just quark labs. Perfect. Makes it easier. Okay. So what about our isolated calibration point? So this is just a diagram zooming in. So an A is going out to the Oort cloud at 100,000 AU. This is welcome to our solar system. And then this is going in to just to show you the eight major planets going out to about 30 astronomical units of Neptune. And then expanding into our own little part of the solar system. And as you can see, we really are quite small in our solar system. What, what I want to point out, unfortunately your lasers died, Adam, but uh, um, here we are. Moon is not that close. This is not to scale. This is showing you the main asteroid belt, okay? And I'm going to focus quite a bit on this today because this, this belt between Mars and Jupiter at about 5.2 astronomical units is a major source of most of the meteorites we obtain. Yes, we get meteorites from Mars. Yes, we get meteorites from the moon, but the, the vast majority actually are coming from this region. So I'm going to focus on this region today and I'm going to ask the question, just how important was aluminum 26 in melting processes in our solar system? And by virtue of that, as a calibration point, how important might it have been in exoplanetary systems? Now, to get to that point, we need to understand something about the fundamental building blocks to our solar system. And this is what our solar system looks like in a log relative abundance plot relative to silicon for the major refractory, dominantly refractory elements. There is actually hydrogen and helium on here, showing what our solar system is basically composed of. And it's showing it in two different ways. It's showing the solar photosphere, and it's showing the composition of what we think are the sort of source building blocks of planets. And that's carbonaceous chondrites. And you can see there's a pretty close correspondence between these chondrites that we actually receive as meteorites on the Earth and the solar photosphere composition. Now, we can talk about why these form and how these form, um, but I'm not going to go into too much detail. Safe to say, in a basic sense, our solar system is a mixture of Big Bang nucleosynthesis products, of products coming from cosmic ray and um, stellar, um, extracellar processes, but also, most critically, stellar sources, which is what George was talking about earlier. 
And if you were to take the uh, periodic table and not slice it off at the end, so there's <laughs> group one is not on there, you would see that you can break these different types of nucleides and elements into their basic process of formation. And what you would find is that our solar system has a range of elements, especially out here to high atomic numbers, that are produced by a range of processes in stars and during the death of stars as supernovae and other types of explosive product. These are the fundamental building blocks. Metallicity defines these initial building blocks and the solar system, our own solar system, suggests we come from a number of stellar sources. So this is important because what you start with in your, in your cooking is going to dictate what you're going to end up with. When you start cooking, if I'm going to follow that, that um, analogy, you also have to see how the mixture is going to turn out. So when you start with this, I'm sorry, it's cutting off here, but when you start with this, this mixture of elements and um, nucleides, what happens to them? They're in a, a stellar nebula, they're at high temperatures and they begin to condense. This is a condensation curve. It starts at 2000 Kelvin just over here. And you condense highly refractory nucleides and elements like osmium, aluminum, so you produce uh, oxides in this early phase. Notice where aluminum lies. It comes out very early in these condensate products. You end up at the very end of condensation with ices and hydrocarbons. This is showing you the, the pillars of creation. This is that lovely JWST infrared image that just came out, I think, last week. And this is the Hubble Space Telescope image. I love both of them. I think they're both great. But they're showing, you know, possibly what star forming regions would look like. And of course, what our initial building blocks would have looked like. To go from this condensation, where you're at 10 to the minus six bar, maybe 10 to the minus four, to producing pebbles or blocks is quite difficult. Nonetheless, we know that it happened because we have planets. And there's a number of different mechanisms by which you could under, undertake this. I'm just showing you three possible methods. Core accretion, which is this gravitationally induced collisions. Basically, things get bigger with time by collisions. Streaming instability in the, in the, the, the cloud of dust and gas produces larger and larger bodies. And this idea of pebble accretion, that you might have large fragments coming into a, probably not this much mass, but certainly a lot of material and they just get bigger like snowballs. My point is here, what I'm gonna talk about is not this phase, but this phase is fundamental because if you're going to have a heating source like aluminum 26, it condenses early, it's going to be in those very earliest phases early, and it's going to be decaying early. Now, how does that decay look? Luckily, I have this on the right side of the, the diagram. So what is the radiogenic power of aluminium-26? The aluminium content of the solar system is about 8,400 ppm. The aluminium-26 to aluminium-27 ratio is 10 to the minus 5. That means roughly half a ppm of aluminium-26 if you assume it's homogeneously distributed throughout the solar system. The energy released during the decay of one atom of aluminum 26 is about 2 million electron volts. Now, if you take that calculation, and um, first let's look at how the fraction of aluminum 26 looks like in the solar system with time. So one half life is 700,000 years. So this is showing you the total fraction of aluminum 26 versus time. And you can see that one half life, two half lives, three, four, five, six, six half lives, you've essentially got no more aluminum 26. So the radiogenic power of aluminum 26 is about 5 million years. Okay, but that assumes all the aluminum 26 was made at one time and it's not- I'm going to come to that. I'm coming to that. <laughs> so if we take that and we look at the amount of power you could create in let's say a five kilometer size body and how much heating it would produce, 
This is actually after uh, some other calculations. I redid them, but I got exactly the same results by Das and Srinivasan. What you find is that you create a lot of heating very, very fast. Okay, within about 300,000 years, you've reached the temperature at which a chondritic body, remember that's the bulk composition of our solar system, can begin to melt iron, nickel, and sulfur, which is the earliest formed melt products, and then to reach the point where you can melt out sodium, aluminium, and silicon. Now, but coming back to your point, how homogeneous is aluminium-26 in the solar system? That is still a matter of debate, but the reality is that it doesn't seem that you had excessive sources coming significantly after this period of time, maybe in this period, but certainly not beyond 10 million years, right? So if you, and to show you that, actually, if you look at, this is just showing you the ages of materials that we know about. So on the top here, this is the beginning of the solar system at four, five, six, eight. This is the age of calcium aluminium inclusions. Remember, calcium aluminium oxides are one of the first refractory condensates. So by definition, these are some of the earliest formed materials in our solar system. Chondrules, chondrites are called chondrites because they're made of these little spherical things called chondrules. They're a millimeter, a couple of millimeters max in size, and chondrites are made predominantly of these silicate materials. Some of them are actually have sulfide and metal. And those range from about 4568 to 4564. These have not, so far as we can tell, been melted. CAIs have not, so far as we can tell, been melted by other processes. But magmatic iron meteorites, these are thought to be the asteroidal cause. So, these match quite well with this melting regime. That's great. That seems to, to line up quite well. The issue is when you look at bodies like Festa, which is one of the largest asteroids in the asteroid belt, or the parent body of Angrites, we don't know which one that is, but it's, it's old. They are actually with just about within the radiogenic power of aluminum 26, but it's getting to the point where you're saying, okay, how powerful is it? What about other radioactive isotopes? Because I keep thinking about potassium-40, but where does, in that plotting curve here, that's just plotting... Yeah, it's just, it's just aluminum-26. Okay. So potassium, thorium, uranium, yeah. these are the big players today, no, still. Potassium dominated, right? Back about, you know, a billion years after it, I thought potassium-40 was the dominated radioactive isotope. I don't, I'm asking, I don't, I'm just trying no, to... No, I, I, I don't think that that's necessarily the case. I think actually the major heat source that's not being considered here, if this is just aluminum 26, then yeah, fine. But the major heat source is actually collisional heat from accretion. But potassium 40 is still decaying today. Right. So these are continuous heat sources. Um, it's undergone three or four half lives, three. So it was, yeah, it was contributing significantly, but the idea is that aluminum 26, because of its very rapid decay, is decaying. That's the thing. I mean, when you have very long lived half lives and potassium is making up slightly less than this total right. of the abundance, it's, it's a prolonged decay, uh, heating source, but it's not a very fast heating source in the early solar system. James, what do you make of the, I think it was Glenn McPherson published a paper maybe a year ago on aluminum 26 and CAIs, and he, he took every number that's ever been published and plotted it out and you get two peaks. This could be speaking to this idea that you might have had multiple sources mm -hmm. at different times. That's one possibility. It does suggest some heterogeneity in the, in the certainly in the inner solar system, um, what matters is when it comes in. And so most of these, these CAIs are all in this age range, so far as we know. So no matter what, which way you look at it, even if you have a slight delay in aluminum 26, you're still not going to have heating coming out to sort of 10 million years, right? Yeah. One last thing. So does this, your plot mean 
that the rate of cork flap supernovae and novas was very much higher some point in the back in time and now it's just nowhere near that rate in order that it's not a constant i don't think i'm you're talking about aluminum 26 yeah. no i'm i'm talking about this as a closed system so what i'm saying is as soon as aluminum 26 comes into the, the solar system region and you've you shut off any more production of it this is what your decay rate will look like i'm not i'm not inferring anything about the Sources. Isn't that a big assumption that it shuts off? Um, I is it an assumption? I mean, what we so what Mark is talking about is in CAIs, you're seeing two peaks in aluminum 26, but we're not seeing peaks in aluminum, we don't see excessive aluminum 26 coming into the solar system 10 million years after its formation. There's no evidence for that. So I don't know if that is a big assumption. I think that is a the border, the border is closed. Yeah. yeah, the borders are closed. Exactly. It's a closed system as far as we understand. It. Yes, George. Well, it, it, in, in fact, it was an early mean that maybe a nearby supernova triggered the collapse of the solar system and injected older 26. And your meteoric anomalies, which we'll probably talk about, were evidence of that. Yeah. So come what may. We make the assumption that there was it was a closed system. Mm -hmm. Now, how long did it take to close? That's a different story. Sure. Now, actually, what I'm going to talk about is what happens to the material. I'm not going to talk about aluminium 26 on its own in isolation. I'm going to talk about what we actually see in meteorites that can tell us something about how realistic any of these models might be. And I'm going to start by talking about something that is strangely aluminum rich. These are two meteorites that were discovered in the Antarctic in 2006, the Graves Nertak 06 128 129 meteorites. They're fairly substantial hunks of rock for our meteorite community, a couple of centimeters across, blocky looking meteorites, very unusual. They came from Graves and Unattack, which is just up here. So this is Ross Island. So there's south, everything is north. And uh, Graves and Unattack is just here in the Transantarctic Mountains. Those were the first meteorites to be found that had very aluminous compositions. Uh, they've been melted. So they are molten volcanic rocks, if you will, from an asteroid. And they have very old ages very close to the beginning of the solar system, four, five, six, five, that sort of time frame. You can see the fusion crust around them, the black fusion crust, telling us they're meteorites. And they have unusual compositions because they have the composition, the bulk composition of the continental crust of the earth, which is very unusual. And so they are, that composition is known as andesite. So they're the first andesitic materials from an asteroidal body. Since then, there's been quite a number of discoveries. In particular, this, this particular meteorite, Urchech 002, a 32 kilogram, it's a big substantial chunk of rock, composition of andesite sample that formed about 1.5 to 2 million years after the formation of the solar system. These rocks, for those of you you said petrogenesis was a cool name. This is petrogenesis is talking about what the, how the rocks formed, okay, from a mineralogical and chemical perspective. And you can see in here, these are actually pyroxenes. This is uh, plagioclase in the silica phase and then methyl in these rocks. Now, they have the compositions of the continental crust. So this is a typical diagram that you would see if you were taking um, an earth science class. It's called a total alkali versus silica diagram. It's a way of classifying rocks. All of the rocks on Hawaii lie in this range here. All of the rocks that you would find in parts of most parts of Chile would lie in this region here. You know, it's very predictable, okay? The bulk silicate earth lies here. The continental crust of the earth lies here. And all of these rocks I'm talking about, the GRA meteorites, Erdchech 002, some of these other ones up here, they lie in this region. Before these rocks came along, 
we assumed the only way you could form an andesite was by plate tectonics. That's clearly not true because there was not plate tectonics acting on these asteroids. What's interesting is that the age of them is, unfortunately it's cut off, but they're substantially after the major radiogenic power that you would expect from aluminum 26. They're clearly melting. They are melting quite a bit. So these are just different diagrams. This is, this is diagrams for actually the measurement of the rocks themselves and taking a series of models to explain how much melting has taken place. Here I'm using the rare earth elements versus um, the composition of chondrites to examine just how much melting has taken place to explain their bulk compositions. And these are experiments done in the lab where people have taken chondritic meteorites and melted them and seen how they behave um, as you melt them. And essentially we come up with the same thing. These things have seen about 13, 30% partial melting of oxidized chondritic compositions. They're coming from more than one parent body. They're coming from at least five parent bodies. And unfortunately this is cut off again. So this is Delta 18 over, this is oxygen 18 over oxygen 16 in per mil value versus a standard versus this is a cap Delta 17 over, which is the basically how far, this is Delta 17 over over here how far it falls off this terrestrial fractionation line. And the point is here, you don't need to know too much about that. The point is, if you look at these bodies for their cap delta 17O, and say, for example, iron versus manganese, they're plotting in a wide, wide range of space, suggesting at least five parent bodies for these things. So this was not a, a, a quirk. This was happening. It was widespread in our solar system. And that's why I have this uh, this one here is widespread silica, aluminium, sodium partial melts on small bodies in the early solar system, showing you Yosemite, bulk andesite composition. Um, this is Dactyl and um, Eda, is a, a binary asteroid system, just pointing out that these compositions were quite widespread. They make sense because what happens is as you melt chondrites, the first silicate melts you get out are this composition. We didn't know this for a while because the experiments were losing sodium. So if you, sodium is a volatile element. So if you lose it, the plagioclase you form suddenly becomes calcium rich. And it was these new experiments where they were able to retain the sodium and potassium that showed actually these are the most common melts you get out of these chondrites. Now, why is this important? Think about it. If aluminium 26 is your heat source, and the first silicate melt you melt out of the, the, these bodies is aluminium rich, what does it do to your heat source? I'll come back to that. I want to point out that these bodies have seen very different histories. And the way I'm going to show you that is with the highly siderophile elements. These are elements, you know, some of you probably have them on your fingers. Certainly all of you have them in your phones. These are the precious metals that we rely on to run our, our daily lives. Osmium, iridium, ruthenium, rhodium, platinum, palladium, rhenium, and gold. I've got two here because they're monoisotopic. We don't measure them typically because we use an isotope dilution method where we need more than one isotope to make the measurement. What's the principle here? If you take a chondrite and you melt it, what happens is that chondrite separates into a metallic core and a silicate mantle. Those siderophile elements, they love being in metal, and siderophile. So they go into the metallic core and leave the silicate portion of these bodies essentially devoid of these elements. It turns out that within these andesitic asteroidal achondrites that I've just been mentioning, they have two very different mechanisms. The GRA meteorites that I showed you earlier, they have very high abundances of the highly siderophile elements. So on this diagram, this is showing you six of the highly siderophile elements that we routinely measure versus the sample over CI chondrites. So 
See how Kondrak's vault solar system would lie somewhere here. The GRA meteorites don't look too far off that composition. They've seen a bit of melting, a bit of metal loss, but not much. These new andesites, and I've measured a whole bunch more so that you're seeing these data for the first time, they match exactly with Erdchech, which we just published on, and they look like they've been heavily fractionated. In other words, they've had the core material removed from them. So these andesite bodies have either undergone partial melting, where they've formed a nascent core, but they haven't completely melted to form things like the GRA meteorites, or they've undergone full core formation and silicate mantle formation in the space of a million years in the solar system. You're forming bodies probably of tens to hundreds of kilometers in size in very short space of time. That makes sense with the aluminum 26. Nice heat source, hopefully driving this type of formation mechanism. We have evidence from other achondrites as well. Unfortunately, this cut up, but these are some nice cross polarized light images, some plain polarized light images of different types of achondrites. They're very cool if you want to see them. I'd be happy to show you lots of pictures of them. These are these different types of chondrites, so uh, of achondrites. Winonites are a bit like chondrite meteorites, and these are more partially melted. They've seen more melting and melt loss. And guess what? If you look at the total volume of metal in these rocks, they decrease as you increase partial melting, consistent with core formation. Now, what these, all, these things all stack up to is that as you're partially melting this parent body, perhaps aluminum 26 is playing a major role in the melting. The moment you produce these aluminous rich metals, you eviscerate yourself of your heat source. Your heat source is now all at the surface of your body or it's being blasted off into space. And this raises a very important problem for this model because this model simply assumes that everything is homogeneously mixed within the parent bodies. It assumes that the aluminum 26 drives off all the volatiles from these parent bodies to leave them dry. As it turns out, we've measured the isotopic compositions of various moderately volatile elements in these aluminous chondritic materials and their residues, the, melt, the mantle products that are left over, and they are not particularly volatile poor. So this does raise the question of whether this type of model actually would fit for exoplanets. And I would suggest some other lines of evidence that are even more simplistic as to why that model might not work as well as we might think. The most simple of which is if we look at the distribution of asteroids in the asteroid belt, this is a very common diagram. This is actually out of a, a paper that I, I put together, but this is showing you the asteroid belt, the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, the frequency of large asteroids we've observed, Paul Vesta lies here in the sort of main frequency. These are resonances between Jupiter and the sun. But what you'll notice is that there's these strange um, letters here and there's different frequencies. This is mean distance from the sun versus composition. And what we find is in the inner part of the asteroid belt, we find much more rocky, dry materials. And as we move further out, we find wetter, more volatile, rich materials. So even within our own solar system, we see this clear dichotomy in volatile enrichment, despite the fact that aluminum 26 was presumably reasonably well distributed throughout. If we look at those differentiated bodies and we look at the condensation temperature, so basically the way you read this, guys, is as you move down to lower uh, condensation temperatures, these are the volatile elements. And we look at their normalized abundance to CI chondrites and silicon, so this is where CI chondrites would lie. We find that parent bodies like the, uh, this is Vesta, the Howardite, Eucrite, Theogenite parent body, these are very volatile poor. This is uh, chondrites, this is the bulk silicate earth, and this is the moon. What we find for the GRA meteorites, for example, is that they're not particularly volatile depleting. 
So even despite the fact that aluminum 26 probably played a key role in their genesis, and they are responsible for eviscerating their own planetary body of that material, it hasn't had as a profound effect as one might expect. Despite all those things, we know that the inner solar system bodies are depleted in volatile elements. We know this. This is a very typical diagram you might see of distance from the sun for, of course, Mercury, Venus, the Earth, the Moon, Mars, and this is Vesta over here. These are the bodies for which we have good data. How do we have good data? Because potassium and uranium are radioactive and they can be measured with gamma ray spectroscopy and things like this. They can also be directly measured in these bodies as well because we have material from them. And what you'll notice is that all of them are depleted in potassium over uranium. So they're depleted relatively in potassium because they all have very similar uranium contents relative to chondrites. That's because potassium is a volatile element and uranium is a refractory element. So during their formation, somehow potassium was lost by some volatility process. This process, I would argue, is not because of heating in the early solar system. This process is actually through a number of complex events. And this diagram here is to remind us that our solar system is four and a half billion years old. Yes, lots of things happened in the early solar system, but most of the processes acting on large planets happen significantly after. The earliest evidence, for example, of rocks on the moon is about 4.5 billion years. It's complicated by the fact that these planets, and this is also, should also be true, I would argue, for exoplanets, have seen late accretion. What this is showing you is um, the main phase of accretion of a parent body. You have some kind of clearing event that produces a core, but then you have later addition of material. Meteorites falling today are late accretion. It's the inefficient accretion of material with time. That's shown on this diagram, showing you the total mass of the body accreted. Most of it is accreted very early. But you can see that there's this very long tail, at least four and a half billion years old, billion years in length, that is accreting stuff later. So this is complicating our understanding of volatiles. But I would argue the biggest control on exoplanets and the planets in our own solar system as the calibration point is not any of those things. It's parent body size. We see an amazing correlation with, for example, the potassium isotopic composition of rocks from these planetary bodies, Vesta, the Moon, Mars and the Earth, and things like surface gravity. This ratio here, this is delta 41 potassium. Delta always stands for parts per thousand, okay? So 41 potassium is normalized is 39 potassium versus a standard. And that standard is known as NIST in this particular case. What this is showing you is that potassium is made of, it has three primary isotopes. We're looking at 41 and 39 here. 39 potassium is a lighter isotope. It's preferentially lost during evapor evaporation processes. So for example, Rayleigh distillation. So 39 potassium will be prefer preferentially lost over 41 potassium. So if you then measure that ratio, it tells you how much potassium has been lost from the system. And so heavier values going in this direction means more potassium loss. Lighter values mean less. So what you're seeing here is that with higher surface gravity, you're retaining more of your potassium than at lower surface gravity. That holds up for a whole range of parameters. This is just another parameter of volatility, but it also appears to relate in some way to the amount of water in these bodies as well. I guess, I mean, I look at Earth and Mars and that had a process of differentiation that didn't occur for the Moon or the Vesta. So, I'm just wondering, I mean, are, are we correlating? Both the like moon and, well, Vesta has differentiated. The moon, the moon has seen 
well, a yeah, slightly different history, but it, it's but certainly different. What is this person's density, like average density? And you get the same thing. You get exactly the same thing. You should, yes. Yeah. So, so probably if you have volatiles present and you form planets fast enough, they're going to be volatile rich. It doesn't matter how much aluminum 26 you have. The more gravity you have, the more you can hold these things in. So I think the point that I want to come to, that I want to sort of finish with, is that it's not just simply one aspect that matters. It's a multitude of aspects. And this is where, coming back to my point, our understanding of planetary materials in our solar system can help with exoplanetary studies. Because you can have a mixture of things the original idea was that all planets were formed from chondrites. We now know that things differentiate, things do transform during their genesis to ultimately accrete to form larger planets like the Earth. So this is what this is showing. It's showing chondritic materials, partially melted materials like the GRA meteorites, parent body, things like Vesta that are fully differentiated. If these things accrete to planets, yes, that will accrete dry, but this will accrete slightly wet. And so the mixture that you get is not dictated by one single process like aluminum 26. And I would argue, in fact, that aluminum 26 may not be a major player in this at all. I'd also point out that when we look at most of the bodies in our solar system, and we compare them to what you would expect if you completely melt a chondritic um, asteroid. If you completely melt a chondritic asteroid, you would find that the core would represent about 49% of the parent body in terms of, of mass. When we look at Venus, Earth, and Mars, we find that they're pretty close to that value. So we would call them chondritic in composition. The moon is thought to have formed by a direct collision with the earth. It has a subchondritic value because it has a very small core. I think a key feature that we need to really focus our efforts on is Mercury because it's what it's the only inner solar system planet that its formation, formation mechanism is, is not well known, but it clearly has a superchondritic core. It has a very large core as a function of its slipping mantle. So this is an important testing bed for looking at exoplanetary systems. And this is where our, soul, our lonely isolated calibration point can, can really be useful. The implications for exoplanetary interiors are, are several. So these are just some images from NASA showing how the mineral physics of the interiors of things like Kepler 407 and other planetary bodies might look. The in initial inventory of elements is clearly important. We know this. The evolution of the feedstocks, in other words, the asteroidal bodies or the, the, the parent, the feedstock masses that produce these planets is essential. And, and one way we can get to tackling this problem is by looking at asteroidal meteorites from our own solar system. Planetary accretion and differentiation mechanisms rule writ large. And, and the bigger the body, probably the more likely it is that you would expect to see a significant volatile contribution, depending of course on how much is initially set. Late accretion is, is going to be a major player in how these bodies evolve. And, and we can see that in our own solar system. And later in evolutionary history, we all know it's going to be important. Things like tidal locking of those planets are going to be essential. So, I hope I've given you a flavor of how looking at solar system materials could be useful in the future to understanding exoplanetary systems. And in turn, I'm sure you can think of many ways in which this science can be improved by looking at exoplanetary systems as well. So um, thank you for attention and um, I'll be very pleased to take some questions. Thank you, James. Pleasure.
Well, first off, did you, did you actually find the media rights yourself? Did you have a picture here? And no, I didn't. Okay. No, no, but I would, I mean, I wasn't on that. I was actually on that trip, uh -huh. but it was the other group that found them. And I'm very grateful to them for finding them because they were. And then how many yeah. of those have, have been found? Like what's the population of those? I mean, they're still a very small fraction, um, but they are increasing substantially in number. As, as I showed you, there's a lot of these Northwest African ones that are coming. Um, now, I would caveat that with what we collect is probably not a particularly good representation of what the, the total fraction should be except for chondrites where we, you know, we have 80,000 nearly <clears throat> chondrites now. And so that, that sort of, that can give you some idea of the population, but these, these are clearly significant because Urbchech is a big chunk of rock. <laughs> um, even the GRA meteorites are big chunks of rock. These are not sort of anomalies within a, you know, a heterogeneous asteroid. They, they are seemingly very important. And if you look at how asteroids should melt, kind of makes sense there should be a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. that's why i gave those two papers the other one was on olivine rich rocks just pointing out that the fact that we don't have them in the collection is not evidence that they were absent and can so. you determine where in versus distance from the sun based on i mean that was so early on the, the early sun and we can you know calculate temperature versus that so this is a kind of holy grail type question. So um, these are non-carbonaceous chondrite type bodies, which from an isotopic point of view, so we use uh, oxygen, which uh, Mark is a progenitor of, but titanium and chromium isotopes. These give us really good indication of the nucleosynthetic components within these meteorites. These are non-carbonaceous. Now, Many have argued that the carbonaceous chondrites, there's non-carbonaceous carbonaceous, are coming from outboard Jupiter, and that the non-carbonaceous are inboard. I I want to see more evidence, but my point is that um, we don't so truly know their original. Or yeah. yeah, the idea is that they're going across a, a specific line of, of growth. So. But we don't know those. We don't know those details until we find the parent bodies. Mm -hmm. the The issue was with the the GRA meteorites. We did try to do some remote spectroscopy analyses, but they're full of nontronite, which is a kind of clay mineral, which made it very difficult because um, this is this is weathering product from the Earth, and it dominates the spectral signature of the, the meteorites. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, would it be, I get how uh, we detect exoplanets, but would it be possible to study the chemical structure of exoplanets as well? I'm hoping you can tell me that. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, there's, there's the, the papers that I showed you earlier. There was one on, um, can we use the, the, the physical attributes of exoplanets to understand their composition? And they make a pretty compelling argument that you can, you can make some pretty good first order observations. I think what you need is, you know, you need really good evidence of the metallicity of the star because we know that in our own calibration point, our sun very much matches the, the bulk composition of our solar system. So that's a pretty good uh, calibration point. So I think, I, I definitely think we're going to see an explosion in papers that are saying, okay, well, based on the composition of the star, based on the size and mass and so on of this, this exoplanet, it's going to have this composition. We've already seen them. In fact, I remember a few years ago, there was one that said that an exoplanet was purely made of carbon, right? It was like a big diamond or something. Turns out it wasn't true, but the, <laughs> it got published in Nature. <laughs> so, so I, I think you're going to see, this is the thing. I, I think you're going to see an explosion in these types of of papers and it would be great to have a calibration method that and I think that's what I'm trying to argue for is is how much do we know from our own solar system how far can we push our limitations in knowledge uh, sorry. Uh, one other thing with uh, 
I was talking to Professor Berg yesterday about this. Uh, how likely is it for other stellar systems to have quartz cloud? Uh, and is, is that related to what we were talking about? I, you know, I mean, my assumption has always been that it's probably going to be a common phenomenon, but uh, maybe you can. I mean, it kind of depends on how, if the Earth cloud formed from the giant planet rearrangement, then you need to have those giant planets do that. So it's, yeah. that's a good question. Yeah. Would it be related to like the study of the asteroid belt? Would it help with like, getting information more about the comet cloud around? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think comets are kind of the, the elephant in the room for a lot of cosmochemists because it's very hard to sample them, right? And, and as soon as they impact the Earth, you know, they're 90% water ices and, and various ices, 10% rocks. How do you really know? You know, this has been one of the big paradoxes for late accretion because we see roughly 0.8% late accretion. So 0.8% of the Earth's mass was added after the core had formed based on highly siderophile elements. But if those were in comets, actually they could have produced as much as 10% accretion and it could have all been water. So this is the idea that water could have been brought to the earth by late accretion. Thank you. Yeah. Would you expect asteroid belts in some of the other planetary systems that are being discovered? I don't see why not. Um, I mean, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be couch my terms here. I, I, I can't see why they wouldn't be a phenomenon. And, you know, it seems logical to me that the regions, especially if you're forming very large gas giants outboard, that you could have regions where you fail to form uh, smaller rocky planets. So I, I, I can't see it being um, being rare. What would be interesting is how diverse those could be. Um, you mentioned aluminum 26 as a particular element that has a role in the early evolution. Are there other elements that we should be thinking about that could have a radiogenic impact or anything that, that could also lead to like, you know, that this particular planet planetary system form near a source that may be different than the US? Well, if it's a volatile rich system, okay. as Shelley pointed out, potassium is a, is a big player, right? So the more potassium you have, perhaps the more it would it would play a role, and it would have a longer role. Mm -hmm. But iron sixty mm -hmm. is a big player. So you know, again, an, another major element produced in supernovae, short half life, could be a major player. So there's there's a number of these um, short lived radionuclides that that are important, but it's really the major ones, the one so. It's going to depend on your, this is why we need more spectral measurements of stars around exoplanetary systems. And we need them to be really good because you can start to see what fraction of, of what particular element is going to be the present. But in, in the case of our solar system, uh, iron 60 and aluminum 26 are really widely considered the main players okay. in that early heating. Other questions? All right, let's give Professor Daly a round of applause. Thank you very much. So we're going to hold you for a little bit because sure. the grad students are going to have some time to chat with you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Yep. Bye-bye, Zoom. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks, bye.